I wanted to begin the message by sharing an illustration that has nothing to do with it. In fact, I was kind of debating whether or not to share this, but, uh, you know, it's one of those things, you just have to do it sometimes. So, what happened was this week, I was dropping my car off for servicing at Firestone up here on, on West Main, and I had, you know, prearranged with Katie. She was going to come about 15 minutes after me. I was going to drop off the car, and 15 minutes later, she would arrive to pick me up and, and bring me here to the church. And so when I dropped off the car, it went a lot faster. The dropping off process only took about two or three minutes. And so I was in the lobby just waiting. And, and you know, I, I didn't want Kate to have to park and come in to get me. So I, you know, periodically I'd get up and kind of look out the window to see if she'd arrived. And the front desk guy noticed that I was waiting for a ride. And, and uh, so after a few minutes, he, he, said, he said, hey, are, are, are you waiting for a ride? And I said, yeah. And he, he said, uh, blue jag? Um, because... Uh, <clears throat> This beautiful blue Jaguar had just pulled up, and I kind of paused for a second, and I said, no, not blue Jag, gray minivan. <laughs> and uh, so the guy next to me thought that was really funny, and, and so he, he started laughing. He said, I bet you would have had a lot of questions if she had come driving up in a blue Jag. I said, I said yeah, and if, if she had dropped me off at the church in that blue Jag, there'd be a whole lot of people who would have a lot of questions. <laughs> so... But that, that led to a great opportunity just to hand, uh, hand him a, a card. Uh, my card has Romans 10, 9 on the back and just to invite him to church. So, by the way, if uh, my uh, Firestone friend uh, came, I'm, we're glad to have you here today. Um, but it was interesting. So we had this kind of brief chat, and then a couple minutes later, my beautiful wife came driving up in our gray minivan. And so I looked at the guy next to me and said, uh, well, my blue jag is here. It was nice to meet you. <laughs> so there's, you know, there's... You know, not a lot of tie to the message on that, but I would want to just point something out. It's just a reminder to me of something my dad uh, used to say quite a bit. He said, he said, listen, he said, we need to stop praying for opportunities to witness, and we need to start praying for courage to take advantage of the opportunities that the Lord puts all around us, right, even in the mundane things of life. There are all kinds of opportunities to just to say a brief word or to uh, just to build a bridge with someone out around there. So let's be praying and taking advantage of those opportunities. But turn with me now, kind of putting that illustration that has nothing to do with message out of your mind. Now turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse 19. So we're going to come to the end of chapter 2 today. We're probably going to get uh, only two points out of three uh, today, and so we're going to wrap up two weeks from now. But we're going to be in Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 22. To pick up a little bit of the context, I just want to begin our reading back in verse 11. So read along with me as I read Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse 11. It says, Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. By abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father." And then our text for this morning. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Now, this section, verses 19 through 22, is the conclusion to chapter 
two. We see that by the first two words there in verse 19. He says, so then, right? This is a phrase that he often uses when he's coming to a conclusion, when he's going to draw out the summary or the implications. He says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And in this conclusion, Paul is going to give us three astounding benefits that flow from our new life in Christ. Three benefits which we have obtained because we have been reconciled with God in our vertical relationship and reconciled with each other in our horizontal relationship, all as a result of our union with Christ and the new birth. And if you'll notice, these three benefits of our new life in Christ have to do with the change of our spiritual citizenship, number one, our adoption into God's family, number two, and then the reality that we've become a living temple of God, number three. So, whereas, if we look back in the context of chapter two, whereas in chapter one, we were, or ch- verse one, we were described as being dead in sin, and verse two says we were following the world, the flesh, and the devil, And verse 12 says that spiritually we were Christless and homeless and friendless and hopeless and godless. We now have obtained three incredible benefits. We are now citizens of heaven, adopted sons and daughters of God, and a living temple where God himself dwells through the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to see these three benefits, wonderful benefits of our new life in Christ. So first, as citizens, we now belong to God's kingdom, right? The, the need to belong has been resolved in Christ. Secondly, as children, we now have a bond with God's family, an unbreakable bond, an eternal bond with God's family. Third, as the church, we are being built into God's temple, and we'll pick up that third point two weeks from now. But I want you to notice as we go through this outline that there are kind of three aspects discussed here. First, there is a change in identity, right? We've gone from strangers to citizens. We've gone from enemies to children. We've gone from Gentiles who are excluded to being full members of the church. There's also a change in relationship, right? We've gone from exclusion to belonging, from enmity to bonding, and from destruction to to building, right? Being built up by the master builder. And then third, there's a change in status, right? We've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, from the family of Satan to the family of God, from a temple filled with idols to the temple of the living God. And so we've experienced wonderful changes in our identity, in our relationships, and in our spiritual status. And Paul is going to explain those changes to us in verses 19 through 22. So let's look at the first point of that outline in verse 19. As citizens, we now belong to God's kingdom. Look at verse 19. It says, So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. You are fellow citizens. The saints who are citizens of the kingdoms, you now have been brought in, you've been grafted in, you have been included in this citizenship, a citizen of the heavenly city of the heavenly kingdom. Now, in his examination of of the words strangers and aliens, the commentator S.M. Ba points out that Paul is using distinctly Greco-Roman categories here. He's using terms that would be very familiar to the Ephesian believers because the city of Ephesus had a system, a three-tiered system of inclusion or exclusion, divided between strangers, aliens, and citizens. So who were these categories, right? Strangers were visitors. They were people passing through. They had no rights. They had no privileges. They couldn't own property. They, had, they didn't, weren't afforded all of the protections. They were just sojourners passing by. They were strangers. Then there were the resident aliens, those who lived permanently in the city but did not have the full rights of citizens. They were second-class people in the city. They were excluded from the privileges of the citizens. And Bao continues to point out that citizenship was the cherished, pri- cherished privilege 
of a few and a very few elite in the city. Only they enjoyed the full protections of the city. Only they enjoyed all of the privileges and benefits. In fact, he points out that most residents of Ephesus had a resident alien status and exceedingly few were full citizens. He cites a late second century inscription found in Ephesus which mentions 1,040 full uh, citizens. This is in a city in which there were tens of thousands of people living. So only a very small percentage of people living in Ephesus and probably only a very few of the people who were in the church in Ephesus were citizens of the city. In other words, the vast majority were excluded from the protections and privileges of citizenship. The only way they could become a citizen was to be born into one of these elite families or to purchase citizenship with a huge sum of money. And so for the common people, citizenship was an impossible dream. They were destined, they and their descendants, to always being kind of second class and excluded. So Paul is using these categories of exclusion and inclusion in order to teach the Ephesian church a vital lesson. When they were born again, there was a massive change in their identity which took place. They went from being excluded as strangers and aliens to full citizenship in the kingdom of heaven and full access into the heavenly kingdom. All of the abundant life, all of the eternal life of the, of the heavenly kingdom is now theirs. They have been made full citizens, full participants in all of the benefits of the kingdom. Now, when we hear kind of this, you know, this analogy of citizenship, we often, it doesn't really strike us emotionally because the vast majority of us have never experienced what it's like to be an alien and a stranger in a foreign land. One of the things I'm very grateful to the Lord for is that in the 12 years that Katie and I and our children lived overseas, we got to experience firsthand what it's like to be a resident alien, someone who is not a full citizen of the country they're living in. It's a continual, continual reminder that you don't belong. We had to spend hundreds and hundreds of hours waiting in line to renew our registration, to be granted the right to stay in the country for three more months or six more months. Then periodically we had to go and renew our visa. So you had to have a visa and then you had to, had to have registration. To do anything, whether it's schooling or, or to go to the hospital or anything, meant gobs and gobs of paperwork. We spent literally hundreds and hundreds of hours waiting in lines. I remember one time we had to drive several times a year to the Moldovan border, cross the border, turn around and come back in in order to get a stamp showing that we'd exited and entered the country in, in order then to be able to go and renew our registration. And so we would be there, and it, it, we would be waiting for several hours in either the bitter cold, if it was winter, or the, or the heat in the summer, while we waited in the line, and there's just car after car of citizens just going by, going by, going by, while we sit and wait and wait and wait and wait. I remember one time uh, when, fortunately I was alone this time, but I was crossing the, uh, a border uh, control point that was controlled by the, a breakaway region of Moldova called the Transnistria region. I only went there once, and you'll understand why after I tell you the story. But as I was there, they, they pulled me out of line, and they, the, the soldiers took me down into this basement, and they sat me across from this officer. And then this about six foot two, 300-pound guy just came and stood right behind my chair and just put his hands on the chair and just leaned over me with his thighs leaning against my back while well, uh, this officer interviews me. And the officer looks at me and says, you know why we brought you down here? Why? Because we think you're a spy. And I, I said very respectfully, sir, I'm not a spy. I'm a theology professor. <laughs> I'm a theology professor and minister of the gospel of Christ. And, and so he, he thought, well, I'll, I'll test that knowledge. So he said, well, tell me this. How many testaments are in the Bible? 
<laughs> you know? And then he, he proceeded to ask me a couple really simple and silly Bible knowledge questions, which of course opened a wonderful opportunity to share the gospel, right? Because I said, well, I said, well, I said do, you, do you mind if I give you a little overview of what the Bible teaches? Yeah, yeah, we better test you out, you know? And so I got to lay out the gospel and take him through different texts. But as, it, as time went on, it became clear that this whole accusing me of being a spy thing was really an attempt to get a bribe out of me, right? Because he started saying, I'm going to call the colonel, a, the, a Russian, you know, he's like, have you heard of the KGB? I'm like, yeah, I've, I've heard of them before. He's like, he's like, well, there's a Russian KGB colonel, it, you know, at an interrogation center not too far away, and I'm going to call him, and he's going to come, and he's going to take you away, and who knows what will happen to you there. And I said, I said, well, uh, you know, apparently the Lord wanted me to share the gospel with you, and if he wants me to share the gospel with him too, I'd be happy to do that. So if you need to make the call, make the call. And, and so he finally gave up, and he's like, come on, just give me enough money for one bottle of vodka, and I'll let you go. And I, I, I very politely said to him, uh, I'm sorry, Christ sent me to show you how you can be saved from sin, not to help you sin or enable you to sin. And so he, he finally gave up, looked at the big guy behind me. The big guy kind of relaxed and motioned me to the door, and I was on my way. But, you know, over the years, I mean, we just had lots and lots of experiences like that. I mean, just lots of ways in which we were very clearly shown that we didn't belong and that we were kind of at the mercy of these officials. We were pulled over hundreds of times by Ukrainian police officers just to check our documents, just to see what we were doing because we're foreigners and what are we doing there. And, and we would have to spend hours and hours going from different offices trying to get all the paperwork to enable us to stay in the country. So when I read a phrase like in verse 19, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. That has a very personal and kind of emotional uh, reaction for me because I, I understand I lived for 12 years in the status of an alien. Spiritually now, we have this incredible blessing. We are now full citizens, fellow citizens along with the saints. Did you know that if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are as much a citizen of heaven as the Apostle Paul is? You are as much a citizen of heaven as any of the disciples or people that you read about in the Bible. You've been granted full citizenship. The parallel passage in Colossians chapter 1 says it this way. It says that he, verse 12, has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. We get to share in that inheritance. And then verse 13 of Colossians 1 says, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. So the first thing that we should do when we read this passage is just rejoice. We've been granted citizenship. Have you ever known someone who, who waited and waited and went through all of the process trying to obtain citizenship? The day that they get it, there's such a sense of relief, such a sense of joy. They can now walk and go and be fully included in all of the benefits and blessings of the country where they're living we have been granted that citizenship in the most glorious of all kingdoms, the kingdom of God, a perfect kingdom where there is perfect justice and perfect peace and perfect joy, and there is no mourning or crying or pain or need. There is eternal joy forever and ever in the presence of the Lord. And we have full citizenships, equal citizenships with all of the saints in that kingdom. There is no second-class citizen in heaven. There is an equality before the Lord of all those who have been brought in to his kingdom. So as citizens, we now belong to that kingdom. We belong there and not really here anymore, right? Our citizenship has been transferred from one kingdom to a different one, right? We used to be citizens of a kingdom of darkness, and we used to have a sense of belonging to that kingdom, right? We fit in with the citizens of that kingdom. We went right along with their way of living, and we felt accepted and included by them. But then when we came to faith in Christ, we were born again, our citizenship was transferred. And whereas we used to be a foreigner to God, 
and a citizen to the kingdom of darkness, now it's exactly switched. Now we are citizens of the heavenly kingdom, and we are foreigners to the kingdom of darkness. We belong there, not here. So now we are strangers and aliens in this world, and the world treats us as such, right? We're Jesus freaks. We're, we don't belong. We don't fit in. We don't go along with the crowd. And so, as most of you know very personally, you feel rejection, rejection by unsafe family members, rejection by your unsafe friends, rejection by your unsaved coworkers or classmates because of your faith in Christ, because you are different. You no longer conform to the spirit of the age, to the God of this world. You now have been rescued and transferred. You are now a citizen of a different kingdom. So you don't belong here anymore. And so the world rejects and excludes you. But when they do, you should rejoice because they are affirming that your citizenship is no longer in this kingdom. You are a citizen of the kingdom of God. So now your sense of belonging is centered around Christ. Your sense of belonging is now centered around Christ's body, the church. And why now is our sense of belonging centered here in the body of Christ, in the church? It's because this is where the citizens of our kingdom gather to worship our king. This is where the citizens of the kingdom come, gathered from the four corners of the earth, from all the tribes and tongues of the, of the earth, gathered into the church to worship our king. And so our sense of belonging is centered here. But along with that sense of belonging is also a sense of longing, right? Because we long to be in our fatherland, or maybe a better way to put it is our father's land. We realize that we're aliens and strangers in this world. We're just passing through. And so we always have this vague sense of being far from home, never settled, always kind of in flux. Well, why do we have that sense of longing? It's because we are not in our homeland. We are not in our Father's land yet. We are still here for a little while to serve as ambassadors, to beckon to other members of the kingdom of darkness and urge them to be reconciled to God so that their citizenship also can be transferred to the kingdom of light. The apostle Peter urges us in his epistle to conduct ourselves as aliens and strangers here on earth. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 9. He, in the context of verse 8, he just got done talking about the doom of those who are disobedient to the word. But in verse 9, he says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. And then here's the purpose so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And so he says, Beloved, verse 11, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. He says, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. He's saying, look, you are now aliens and strangers in this kingdom of darkness, so keep yourself away from the fleshly lusts which characterize the citizens of that kingdom. Live as citizens of light, even in a dark world. And so I want to say a few things maybe to some of the teenagers, the young people that are gathered here. You are living in an age, right? Your teenage and your young adult years are an age in which you have a very powerful desire to belong, to fit in, to be accepted. And that desire can be used either for good or for evil, depending upon who you want to belong to and where you want to fit in. 
If you want to belong to Christ and to his church, that desire will drive you towards holiness. If you want to fit in with the world, it will drag you into sin. Do you want to fit in with unbelievers and the sinful ways of the kingdom of darkness? Or do you want to fit in and belong to Christ with the fellow citizens of heaven in the church? Do you want to belong to that which is holy and true and right or that which is sinful, deceptive, and destructive? I want to urge our young people to have an ambassador's mindset. The mindset of someone whose citizenship is in a different kingdom, but you are living here in this dark world to be an ambassador, to urge others to flee from the wrath to come. And notice that an ambassador's loyalty is to the country that sent him, not the country where he lives. He lives amongst the citizens of another kingdom, but he does so to urge them to be reconciled to the king who sent him. I've said it before, I want to say it again, that I want our children and our teens and our young adults to have unbelieving friends. Because an ambassador befriends people in order to reconcile them to the king. But it is important to be an ambassador who influences others, not a naive sheep who gets influenced by others. Right? Can you imagine if you sent an ambassador to an enemy kingdom to try to pronounce to them a message of peace and reconciliation, and instead of, instead of winning others to peace with your kingdom, they betray your kingdom and join the enemy in the way that they live and in their loyalties and their way of life. I want to urge our young people to have the mentality of an ambassador. Right? If someone is sinking in quicksand, you need to stand on the rock and reach down and pull them out. You don't jump into the muck and mire with them. You rescue them. You be an influencer, not an influencee. I also want to urge our young people and our teenagers, commit yourself to only dating believers. Only dating believers, never unbelievers. Because marrying an unbeliever is forbidden by God in Scripture very clearly for your own good, for your own sake, and for the sake of maintaining a good witness to the world. But it's also forbidden because if you marry an unbeliever, it will place your future children in an immediate tug of war between two kingdoms. To have two parents who belong, whose citizenship spiritually is in two different kingdoms, places the child in a place of being literally torn in two in two directions. In our church, we have quite a few families where one of the parents is a believer and the other is an unbeliever. And there's basically three ways that that's occurred. Sometimes it's because both of them were unbelievers when they got married, and then one of them gets saved and the other has not, at least not yet. Sometimes a believer gets tricked by an unbeliever, And so they marry the person thinking they're a believer, but really that person was just a pretender. And after the marriage, they quickly give up pretending. Sometimes it's because a believer did disobey the Lord and married an unbeliever even though they knew it was wrong. But regardless of how it happened, the Scripture is very clear that marriage is sacred, those vows need to be kept, the believing spouse now has to do everything in their power to lead their lost loved one to Christ. The Lord wants them to be his light in that family and wants us as a church to come alongside that believing spouse to support them, to pray for them, to help them. But I think that all of the married couples who find themselves in that situation of being married to an unbeliever would say to younger people, marry in the Lord, right? That's the phrase that Paul uses, marry in the Lord, marry a believer, Marry someone whose Lord is the same as your Lord, whose path is the same as your path, whose principles are based on the Word of God as yours are. It's very difficult to have a family where one is a citizen of one spiritual kingdom and another a citizen of a different kingdom. As citizens of a heavenly kingdom, 
we no longer belong to the world, but we do belong to God and to each other, which is why the church is so precious. We belong. We belong in God's kingdom. We belong to and with each other. Look now at the second benefit that the Lord gives us. It says in the end of verse 19 that we are of God's household, right? Not only are we fellow citizens with the saints, we are of God's household. We belong to his very family. As children, adopted children, we now have a bond with God's family, an unbreakable bond, an eternal bond with God and with each other. In chapter 1, Paul talked about our adoption as sons and daughters into God's family. And he references it again here in verse 19. He, he's saying, look, we are of his household. He not only brought us into his kingdom, he brought us into his home. He enables us to call him Abba, Father, Daddy. You are of God's household. Not just citizens, but royalty. Princes and princesses. You have all of the privileges of the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, the New Testament continually calls us co-heirs with Christ. In fact, the love and the rich reward that the Father has in store for Jesus, He has by grace included us in. MacArthur puts it well. He says, because we have identified ourselves with His Son by faith, God now sees us and treats us exactly as He sees and treats His Son with infinite love. Because the Father cannot give anything but His best to the Son, He cannot give anything but His best to those who are in His Son. All right, this is why Romans chapter 8 says, if God gave us His Son, will not He along with Him graciously give us all things? Right? Everything that is due to Christ because of his righteous life, because of his perfect love for the Father, is now ours by grace. Verse 18 of Ephesians 2 says that we have access in one spirit to the Father. Just like a little child can climb on his daddy's lap. Not just invited into the kingdom, but invited into the very heart of God. And so we have this bond, right? And Romans 8 says that this bond is unbreakable, right? Paul says, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ, right? Not the present nor the future or height or depth or anything in all of creation. Nothing can separate us from God's love, right? This bond is unbreakable. It is eternal. For it is the same bond of love that the Father has with the Son, and we have been included in it by grace. But not only have we been bonded to God, we've been bonded with each other, right? When, you're, when you get adopted, you're now brothers and sisters with everyone else who's adopted into the family. You're now bonded both vertically and horizontally because all of your brothers and sisters, we're all nourished by the same spiritual food. We're all given life by the same blood of Christ. We all breathe the life-giving air of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And so if we look a little bit ahead, look down to verse 21 in our passage, Ephesians 2.21, it talks about the whole building being fitted together and growing into a holy temple in the Lord, right? We are bonded with each other. In fact, we are being fitted by Jesus Christ, the master builder. We are being fitted together, Paul says. Paul is using the analogy of stones being placed together in order to build this temple, and the term that he uses here in verse 21, when he says that we are being fitted together, it's a term that doesn't appear anywhere else in all of Greek. Paul took two words and kind of combined them to make a new word to describe this beautiful truth. You know, families often make up kind of their own internal words, right? You kind of combine words and make up your own little family word. And that's what Paul does here. He's saying we are being fitted together, placed into relationship with each other by God. The best way I can try to describe this to you is 
the way puzzle pieces fit together, right? Alone, a puzzle piece doesn't show you the whole picture, right? No one of us can display the full majesty of God, the full character of God alone. And so God takes us and places us together. He fits us together. And together we display to the world, as Peter says, the excellencies of him who called us. In Paul's day, they, I don't know if they did puzzles or not. Um, No one wrote about it, so I don't know. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But what they did do is they had to build buildings out of stone. And as S.M. Bao, who does some great uh, historical context, points out, each of the stones had to be fitted together based on its particular shape. In fact, Another commentator writes, he says, today the process of fitting stones together is rather simple because mortar is used in between the stones. But in Paul's day, they didn't use mortar, and so there was an elaborate process of cutting and smoothing the stones so that they fit exactly next to each other, right? The stonemason had to take a chisel and hew off the rough edges, hew off the things that didn't fit in order to make each stone fit perfectly with the other. You know, that's a great analogy for what God is using all of us to do for each other. The master builder is taking each of you as individual stones, and he is hewing off your rough edges in order to fit you together so that all together we can be a holy temple for the Lord. Can I just encourage you, and this is kind of the application for today, In churches, there's going to be rubs and conflicts. There are going to be people in this church that just rub you wrong. They disagree with you on something, or they just get in your, you kind of, you kind of cross paths in in, in awkward ways, or, or you just have disagreements over something. There's going to be people that just drive you crazy and frustrate you. And you're, it's going to be hard for you to be in this church body together with them. They're going to challenge you. There's going to be this constant friction and constant rub. And a lot of people get very discouraged by that because they think the church should be heaven and they think that we should all be in perfect harmony with each other. But what they don't realize is that the master builder is fitting stones together. They're of different shapes and sizes. We're not like each other. But he's taking us as different as we are and molding us together. And to do so, he's chipping off the edges that don't fit. He's using iron to sharpen iron. He's using stone to sharpen stone. He is hewing off the rough edges of our character so that we, in unity, could be the temple of God. So the application is this. How are you doing as a stone in that living temple? The temple which is founded on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ himself, with that word himself emphasized, being the cornerstone. Aren't you grateful that Christ is the builder? Aren't you grateful that he is fitting you together with those that he's placed in your life for the purpose of your sanctification? Let's pray. Lord, we come before you, Lord, first of all, grateful that we are citizens of heaven Lord, grateful that we are sons and daughters who belong to you and to each other. And Lord, we're grateful that we are living stones being built into a holy temple in the Lord, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ and Christ alone being the chief cornerstone. Lord, may we, in unity and love, fulfill that purpose, Lord, of being a holy temple. We ask this in your name and for your glory.